Hello everyone and welcome to The Inquisitive Brain with Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings you interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. In this episode, I'm delighted to welcome Alicia Patterson to the show. Alicia is a counselor and she's an expert in women's pelvic health. This is a very interesting topic and there are different areas of pelvic health and so we're going to delve into all of them. She's a practitioner with many aspects in common to myself. She's trained in EMDR, she's a body psychotherapist, she's trained in dance movement and also DBT. I'm really interested in her dance movement therapy because when we talk about movement and the body, this is an area whereby we can become stuck and you know that i often talk about mind body connection mind body experience and so even if you know people talk about oh you must move you must exercise and i know that rubs people the wrong way because sometimes people don't want to do that but if you can move it makes a difference and i know that dance movement therapy is fantastic without further ado let's welcome alicia to the show okay Alicia, welcome to the show. Nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I know there's different areas of pelvic health. So I want to touch upon each one. Mm -hmm. Let's start with trauma-informed pelvic health. Why is that important? Why is it important for us to know about it? And tell us what it's all about. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. Um you know, the, the word trauma has become a very uh, popular and really big thing. And I think the last decade, especially, it's just become, uh, you know, one of those buzzwords. So trauma can mean a lot of different things. And for me, uh, pelvic trauma and trauma-informed care and pelvic health care is awareness that so many people you know, across all identities and genders have had, <clears throat> excuse me, um, disruptive experiences around this part of their body. And we have a pelvic nervous system. Our nervous system is so sensitive and so tender and really responsive to our experiences. And the, you know, the, the pelvic health care and trauma field is just a laundry list of many, many different challenges that show up in this area of people's bodies. And, you know, I'm a counselor and I also um, have a specialty and I really want to focus in and work around specifically with female anatomy and trauma-informed pelvic care. And it's astonishing to me how many people report these very painful experiences with this part of their body and that um, it just continues to happen in their healthcare environment and sometimes at home with their partner. So I just, I feel like it's like a, a huge rabbit hole that we can go down. And um, for me, the most helpful thing was learning about the anatomy of this part of our body and why we might be having these types of responses and starting to understand the muscles and the organs and the nerve system and how all of these parts of us are, you know, talking to our brain. And um, it's been a, a really wild thing for me to start to understand all of this for myself and to work with my clients around this. And it just blows people's minds, which is um, really beautiful. And like, I feel a lot of gratitude to have access to this in my life. So many people on this planet never have access to this type of information or knowing themselves or care. And I also feel really disappointed. I feel like it's kind of like basic human um, knowing of ourselves and how to be with other people. And so many people don't have awareness. And it just feels to me like one of the biggest misses, you know, that we could have. This is our intimate place in our body. This is where we birth children from, you know, it's one of the most primal, primitive kind of biological things. So pelvic trauma is, um, 
It could be sexual assault. It could be birth trauma. It could be um, a painful medical procedure. It could be horrible symptoms and people have really chronic pain that they just can't get answers to. So, you know, trauma-informed care means a very wide range of things in um, the healthcare and therapeutic environment. Yes. Now, that's very helpful. And what drew you towards that area? Because, you know, when we're doing our counseling courses, sometimes we are drawn to different. But I don't know if that was the case with you. Was it outside of the course or what drew you towards that area of study? Yeah, my my own journey, really. You know, I had a really very challenging experience of my menstrual cycle from a young age and was just, you know, all over the place trying to find answers and couldn't get a lot of clarity. And as I was training to be a dance movement therapist, that's my official, um, you know, there's a real degree in that somatic psychology and dance therapy is my roots. And that's what I chose to do my schooling in. And as I was doing all of this movement therapy and doing a lot of dance work, I felt like this part of my body was like a huge gateway for me spiritually and therapeutically and in my own process work with myself. And I was having uh, challenges with my body and my cycle as I was getting older and into my, you know, mid and late twenties. And the more I started pulling the thread on um, holistic information and kind of turning away from modern medicine, you know, I don't want to smash modern medicine. I'm not going to like, come on here and do that. That's not what it's about for me, but I do feel like modern medicine really misses this part of healthcare in a lot of uh, very sad ways. So I started turning toward, um, you know, all the expensive, holistic, kind of mysterious ways of caring for this part of our body. And I had incredible results for myself. So I pivoted into doing some training and making sure that I could pass um, these and for this information and modalities onto other people. And, and the internet has just really exploded this. And again, in the last decade, there's so much more information out there and it can be very confusing. You know, there's a lot of people, um, you know, goddess Yoni work has like become a whole fad. And I just want people to have access to care and therapeutic space that is really safe for them to explore these questions. Um, so my my own experience of my body, I've been doing this kind of exploratory work for myself with all of this content for 15 years and has really shaped my adult life. And I'm so grateful that I got into it when I was young because it's really turned my health around. Um, so I, I have abundant need that comes into my office and especially modern societies, you know, you're in the um, UK and the United States, we have so many challenges around this part of our body. It's like one of our pain points, I think, in modern societies from our lifestyle, you know, sitting and high levels of stress and, you know, there's fertility challenges and a lot of birthing issues and um, people are in such need around this topic, which is why I'm so grateful for you to ask me on your show and talk about it. You know, th this is fantastic. And it does go deep as well. So thank you for that. That's helpful. And thank you for sharing that because it is personal information. But um, you're an expert by experience, but also an expert because you're trained, you're fully trained. So let's talk about the the mind-body connection uh, in terms of pelvic health. Why is it important to consider, to explore how the mind and body work together and can inform what happens? Absolutely. That's one of the, um, it's so important. You know, I, I talk with so many of my clients and the way that I have online materials and the way that I structured them is like anatomy first, always just looking at how our bodies are structured. And it's so um, fundamental and foundational for me with this conversation. I recently did a nerve class that just like blew my mind and I loved it. And, you know, an anatomist and he's got 
um, photos and video footage of working with a cadaver, you know, a, a human body and just showing how the nerve system works. And he started with the brain and our brain is talking to our nerve system and our nerves are talking back to our brain. You know, that's the most basic definition. We know that now. And with the pelvis, you know, our, our pelvis is the furthest away organ system from our brain. It's like, there's a lot of distance between that part of us and our brain. And the, one of the easy things to talk about, for example, is the nerve signaling from the bladder to the brain. I work with so many people that have um, urinary challenges, you know, like the long laundry list of all the urinary stuff, especially as people um, have children or start to get older and their hormones change and they get into the menopausal shift of their life. And they're going like, what is going on with my, you know, my urinary experience and getting up in the middle of the night or not being able to hold my urine. And so nerve signaling is our nerves are talking to our brain and there's a very um, specific dynamic with our brain and our kidneys and our bladder and our kidneys are our stress system. You know, those are our adrenaline and cortisol centers. And if we're pumping and dumping stress chemicals, our bladder is like the bottom, like, you know, the bottom of the lake, I say, it's like the sediment area and just all of our experiences funneling down into our bladder and our bladder is talking to our brain. So, you know, like, if someone is, um, we get a signal that we have to go pee, we have to urinate, but we're in the middle of a work meeting and it goes away and then it will come back and, you know, an hour say is like a healthy nerve signal. Some people get that nerve signal in 10 minutes and then they're going, uh oh, and, and then it comes again and faster and more urgent. And they're like, you know, something is, something's not right here. This isn't manageable. So um, it's really wild for me. You know, I've had all these public health challenges. I've had many, many UTIs in my past, like chronic UTIs is a whole thing for some people, urinary tract infection. And since I've done all this work for myself, I have the bladder of a saint. Like I can hold for hours and it, like, I'm so grateful, you know, I've like really attended to um, working with my urinary system and I have this whole different experience of it. And it is so like fused with our brain. We can't talk about our organ system without talking about our brain. So there's so many intricate connections between this mind body connection. Every single organ has its own version of what I just talked through. You know, the, the bladder is a really easy one to do. But our liver, our gut brain, you know, we know so much at this point about our heart. Um, I'm thinking of the the images of the heart and like there's this just a bundle of nerves, you know, it, it's total chaos, basically. It's like our nerve system is just, you know, reaching into all these parts of our bodies that are so, so deep, as you said, like this is so very deep. And um, if I could clue people in, I, I always focus on the nervous system. If I have one system I could choose to focus on because it controls everything. It's running through everything in our body. It's like the master conductor. So this mind body connection, you know, our, our brain is so brilliant, but our body is really guiding how things are going. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I always say it's called a CNS or central nervous system for a reason. It's yeah. central. And yeah. yeah, absolutely runs everything. But that very nicely guides us into the topic of neuroscience and mm -hmm. how, how our brains will be connected. So can you expand just a little bit on that so that people understand when you're working with pelvic health or you're looking at that, why it's important to kind of correlate the issues of how your brain is working. Um, yeah. Your pelvic health. Yeah. I love neuroscience. I um, really love reading about it and trying to educate myself. And 
there's there's like a couple different directions I feel like I want to go in. And the first one is that for so many people who um, explore the pelvic health journey for themselves, especially in a like, you know, non-manipulative way, like I trained with a physical therapist and um, I really appreciate the nuance and understanding that there's like manipulative work. There's like, um, like we're going to change what your body is doing, which sometimes is important. And then there's soft touch work, which is like just listening and kind of allowing the body to change. I'm on the soft touch side of things. I feel like manipulative work. I'm so sensitive. My sensitivity level is like through the roof. So any type of like we're going to create change just t- tends to like kind of throw me not in a good way. So with the soft touch approach of things, so many people in their public health journey have a kind of um, spiritual awakening or spiritual experience. And I really attribute this to the nervous system. And one of my favorite spirituality books that I've ever read, he said, all spiritual experiences are neurological it's different parts of our brain are leading to, um, you know, whatever, whether it's visions or memories or ancestral information or soul travel, or, you know, people have all these different languages for how they want to describe, but, um, and I don't really pretend to know what the right language is, but I've experienced for myself and so many people I work with have these, um, very and it can be very dysregulating it can be like um jarring or disturbing it can be like i'm having these images and these quote memories that like i don't think are from me or my lifetime and that for me is one of the most fascinating things about the pelvic health journey is especially working around the ovaries you know our ovaries are little hubs of genetic information they're like these little precious materials of dna and people have these wild um spiritual kind of awakening experiences when they start to work with their ovaries in a very gentle way and for me it's all neurological you know if you're getting information in your brain then your brain activity is really responding to what's happening in your cellular memory, in your body, and in your nerve system. So um, what the other kind of path I was going to talk about and go down is I just, I'm reading a, a really incredible book about working with survivors of childhood sexual abuse And they talk about the, um, I'm not going to do it justice. You know, it's like heavy duty, like brain chemical, which is not my forte. I don't remember all of the names of the chemicals, but they talk about how if um, especially a developing child has a very jarring or scary experience, especially around this part of their body, it starts to signal different parts of their brain. And then as they grow into an adult, their arousal system is just totally Uh, miswired if you will like they're getting floods of panic chemicals and then they're dissociating and they're not present and then they have memory lapse and amnesia and you know this this is what our brain does our brain is designed to protect us and make sure that we can handle our life experience so you know for better or for worse this part of our body is holding so much incredible influence over our brain And if we have positive experiences, we're going to, um, you know, have a lot of pleasure and have a a lot of balance in our bonding chemicals and our relationship to intimacy, which is all about our heart and our brain. You know, we know that with our perinatal research that's out there now. And if we have very painful, traumatic, neglectful, or abusive experiences, our brain and our bonding system is going to experience a lot of Uh, pain and disorganization and protection and everything in between you know it's like we all have some gradation like it's not like it's either all good or all bad we usually have some mix of um, some things to work with just based on our human history you know our world has been through uh, it's not pretty you know it's like we're we're sitting on a lot of um, 
pain and ancestral trauma and that lives in all of our bodies. And it's incredible to me, you know, I feel like my own brain has gone through so much change since I've started pulling these threads for myself, which I'm really grateful for because, you know, my, my grandparents and my parents, like they, they got to a certain um, place for themselves. And then I was able to like pick that up and go further, which I'm really grateful for. It's a fascinating area of study. And as you were speaking, I was wondering, thinking about the wider, uh, I suppose, the wider aspect of how we were brought up societal changes or influence on sociology. For instance, women are taught from the time they're aware to keep their legs closed, cross their legs, um, whereas men were shown that it's okay to just sit with their legs fully, you know, open, apart, expose, all of that, men shirt off, women covered up. Now, all that's for reason, of course. Um, but psychologically, I just wonder how our, how society or how our safeguards in society, because those are safeguards, would um, influence something like our pelvic health. And I would think it might be positive in a way because spiritually it's very protective. We talk about the chakras, we talk about your sacral chakra and putting your hands um, just, you know, just a little bit lower than your stomach and just covering that part or crossing your, your ankles when you want to feel protected and safe. So I would think it's an influence, but I'm aware that I'm going off on a tangent. So let's let's bring bring it back to to your work never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now thank you for your support you make this podcast possible now back to the show let's touch upon dance therapy uh emdr as well um dance therapy has it's so wild to, you know, I've been in my work for about a decade ish. So my perspective has um, just really grown and widened the longer I've worked in the psychology field. And I feel like, um, you know, in terms of hierarchy, the medical system is kind of, you know, sitting in the, the king's chair at the top and the psychology field is like, within that and I feel like the psychology field unfortunately is kind of like the stepchild of the medical system like a lot of people just don't want to deal with mental health and even with the hospital I worked at um, when I first got out of my school they built this incredible new hospital and then the mental health uh, unit was the only one that was left in the old (laughs) building and I was like wow you know what a metaphor so I think that um you know, there's a lot of taboo and judgment and painful feelings about psychology sometimes in the mental health field. And for good reason, in some ways, you know, working in that hospital, I was like, in so much pain about how I saw humans being treated. I was, I said, I gotta go, you know, this isn't right for me. And um, somatic psychology, I think is like the stepchild of the psychology field, the body-based and um, body psychotherapy and dance movement therapy is very, very specialized. It's very kind of like there's only a couple of schools in the country in the United States, for example, that have master's degrees in somatic psychology. And it's all about including the experience of the body in mental health treatment. So that's, that's really the foundation of the field and my reasoning for going toward it. And there's, there's branches. Um, I chose to go toward dance movement therapy because I was so much more drawn to the movement aspect of things. Um, I'm very physical. I've played competitive sports for a long time in my life. I've just always processed a lot through movement. It just really helps me. So that's why I was like, I 
I know this about myself and here's this option to kind of keep that thread. And I know that I'm comfortable with that. So I pivoted towards that. Um, and it was so uncomfortable for me, you know, um, sports and no stretching and a lot of heavy duty kind of high intensity activity for most of my life. And then I get into this dance movement therapy field that is very much about, um, it, it can be about, you know, harder movements and higher capacity, like not that it's not about that, but a lot of flow and softening and surrendering and yielding and laying on the floor. And, you know, I was just like, I got into this pretty young when I was 25 and it just blew my mind and was um, so tender and very painful for me emotionally. You know, I remember my, one of my favorite memories is my first um, graduate class in um, dance movement therapy and starting to work with these fundamental movement modalities that are DMT, you know, they're trademarked and like have lineages and all this stuff. Um, which also, by the way, are in a lot of ways, indigenous <laughs> practices. And um, there's so much around white dance therapists and how they kind of took certain practices from things and then made it into their own modality. So that's just like a little nugget to be aware of when you're looking into the dance movement therapy field. Um, it's about ritual. It's about rhythm. It's about body movement. It's about group work, you know, very healing reparative experiences for a lot of people that have lost their connections to their roots and their culture, especially in the United States. So I, um, it just was really striking to me. I didn't have a lot of words for how my nervous system was responding. And I remember laying on the floor and we were doing this exercise around yielding and softening and being supported by the floor. And I just could not, like, I was rigid. I had so much tension in my body I think I came into somatic work, like inflamed, you know, just like my whole body kind of, I didn't know, but now when I look back, I'm like, yeah, like everything was an in inflammation state. And I had my teacher like, you know, shaking my leg and he was like, just yield, like, you know, let it go. I, I was sobbing. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, it was so painful for me. And now uh, 10 years later, I'm able to soften and able to yield, but it's, it's been such a journey and it's like one tissue layer at a time, you know, like my skin and then my muscles and then my nerves and then my organs. It's, it's really wild. And the somatic field is the only thing that was effective for me. I had done talk therapy and it didn't really do much. So then when I found out about the somatic field and I met the faculty in my program, I was like sold, you know, I moved across the country to go to school and um, it's done so much for me and I really believe in it. Wonderful. It is offered here on the NHS, on the our National Health Service. So uh, we, I worked at a hospital as well, a mental health hospital here. And it was offered as well as art therapy too. And we used to hold art groups for people with complex needs. And just having that space of not being in your mind, just maybe with a paintbrush in your hand or doing a dance movement. I don't know what that, whatever that does for a lot of people, it works. Something happens there. Which brings me to, because you're also trained in DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And so tell us about your experience uh, and why you chose DBT, because it's not, it's like MBT, it's like mentalization-based therapy. It's, you know, they're side by side, but they're different. But it's not mm -hmm. something that's widely that people, it's very specific for a very specific client-patient group. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of interesting, you know, to be like, so movement oriented and holistic and all these other types of trainings, and then EMDR and DBT. And 
I just, I feel like it's really important to have a range of different um, trainings and, and access and modalities. And I feel very grateful that I've had experience with working with very severe mental illness and, you know, like the most acute, um, high level, high intensity needs that I think you can get. And I have my own business, you know, I'm in private practice. So I do feel good about having skills and the awareness and, you know, what can I work with and what's not right for my practice. And um, DBT really just came from my internship training when I was in school. I did my training with a inner city, um, low cost counseling, like trauma center, you know, really incredible trying to give access to more, um, alternative services, but still with like the very high need population in Denver. So DBT was a big part of their program and I was required to do training in DBT. I ran a DBT group while I was, um, doing my training and, you know, I found it, um, it's kind of interesting. I feel like I have a, a good friend who is a Jungian psychologist and she's also very into DBT and does DBT work. And it's just kind of interesting to have a, I do think the system is, um, you know, it's, it's old school a little bit. Like it feels a little archaic sometimes, I've worked with DBT with a couple of people and I'm like, you know, sometimes these heavily structured systems are what somebody needs. And I also really try to adapt it and like, you know, here's the book and here's you, <laughs> you know? So it's like, let's make sure that it stays um, applicable and relatable. And I think DBT is incredible and I only pull it out for, you know, very specific, um, clientele needs. And, and it's been a long time. I trained in it a long time ago. So it's kind of foundational for me. And, and sometimes I find myself, um, utilizing a part of it. Like let's talk about distress tolerance, you know, just like having that language. If someone is experiencing a very intense, um, you know, something, especially with the personality challenges that it, it can be helpful. So, and it's not, um, it's not my main thing, you know, it's like, it's something that I'll rest on if I really need it. That's my orientation to DBT. You've got many tools in your toolbox. It's brilliant to have always. <clears throat> yeah. I need more and more tools. You know, <laughs> I'm like, we just need more. But it is the the bane of a therapist's existence really we see something we want it we want it you know so yeah. it's what we do we're always on a course we're always doing something mm -hmm. between supervision and that it's a busy life <laughs> and it is. Clients. but um i would say to our viewers our listeners i don't know what i'd be interested to get your thoughts on this i think that is the makings always of a great therapist um not stuck in a particular modality, open, uh, you know, working alongside conventional medicine. That's what you're looking for when you're looking for a therapist. Um, unless you want to go for analytical therapy, you know, you want to see a gestalt analyst or something or psychodynamic. But someone like yourself who's more, would you say you're more integrative? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I really... Um... I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, I think there are some people that they find their one thing and that, you know, that's their thing. That's all they do all day, every day. This one modality, that's just not my style. It's not my personality. I think I would like not be able to continue in the field, honestly, if I was boxed into one thing that I had to do all the time. Um, that's why I love having my counseling practice and my women's public health practice. You know, I have two very different, um, practices with people and it's still me, you know, I still have all of the training, but it keeps things variable for me. And that was my advice from, uh, this teacher and this internship director was the same person for me. And he said, if I can give you one piece of advice, it's to do many things because otherwise you're going to get bored and you're going to get burnt out. And I'd like to see you be in this field for your whole career. 
So I've, I've really taken that to heart and I never want to stop training. I always want to be uh, finding new modalities and um, I feel good about that. I have a lot of different trainings under my belt, but I'm not like we, you know, I'm a gestalt therapist and that's what we're going to do together. I like to pull it out when I think it's appropriate and it works really well for me and my clients. Right. Yes. Would you combine the two or what do you tell clients who come to you to say that, okay, I'm under this, I don't know, psychotherapist or I'm see I'm on this medication. Um, but that, but now I want to come to you for dance movement therapy or DBT. How are those combined and what's your approach? You know, my parents are educators and from a young age, like when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my career, it was uh, kind of traditional, like some type of public service work. I just, that was what was available to me. That was what I was being kind of guided toward, you know, teacher, doctor, nurse, therapist, PT, kind of those um, different types of sections and options and so uh, my first job out of college was with a healthcare recruiting firm, like staffing. Um, so I, I got to learn about different medical positions and staffing them. And that was really interesting for me. And I ended up, um, you know, I've had a lot of different jobs. I was like, I, I really need to find, I just needed exposure and I needed to experience different things. So that's um, a lot of what I did when I was young one of my my job before I ended up going to graduate school for somatic psychology was, and I worked there for years, I had a really positive experience and great relationship with the team, um, was working for an orthopedic surgeon's firm in the uh, practice, excuse me, in the Washington, D.C. area, which, you know, I know this now that I've moved across the country, but uh, the D.C. area is incredibly competitive it's very, you know, high, like Maryland is the highest um, educated, like second highest educated state in the United States. And it's also the second wealthiest state in the country. So I was exposed to like a pretty high caliber of medical professionalism and care. And I didn't really know because it was, I was like, I don't know, you know, this is my first medical job. Um, But I got to work alongside and Uh, very challenging personalities as well. You know, the orthopedic um, doctor group is kind of notorious for the, their like personality type. It's a very hard field to get into. They're very competitive. Um, It's very high pain. And I just got to, I got to take stitches out. I got to remove casts. I got to dress wounds. I got to work with these incredible doctors and I got to be in an operating room a couple of times because they were like, you're so young, you don't know what you want to do, like, come with me. And I just, you know, I felt like they were incredibly generous with me. And uh, my experience while doing that job, I just found myself, you know, I would see the injuries that were so like clean and clear and kind of easy to fix. And then the rehab was like, boom, boom, boom. Um, It was kind of boring to me. I just, I wasn't very interested in it. Uh, You know, it was like really cool to serve these people and have a good experience with them. But what I found myself more drawn to and more interested in was the very complex cases and like the drug seeking and the really intense pain syndromes and the spinal doctor, for example, like back injury patients, it's like so, so painful and so hard to recover. And I was like, what are these people's childhood? Like, what is their trauma history? That's what I found myself curious about. Of course, I couldn't do that work because I was working in a doctor's office, but I just, that's what I found myself more interested in was like the complexity of why these humans are not getting better or having these very strange reactions to a health event or, um, you know, their drug seeking behavior. I saw a lot of drug seeking with opioids and I just found myself pivoting toward the higher need um, experience in the healthcare field. And then I found out about somatic psychology and I just, you know, and I do, I also think that 
the East Coast and the United States is very cerebral. It's very academic. People are really, you know, all up in their heads, which now I kind of miss, you know, out in Colorado, things are very holistic and more body driven, but I'm kind of looking for that elevated mind thing. And I have a hard time finding it in Colorado, which is a little challenging. Um, But I was so, I was up in my head and I hadn't done any work on my body. So I found myself uh, balancing out by going towards somatic psychology, even though I was an athlete, you know, athletes are often trained to suppress their emotions and move forward with whatever they're doing so that you can compete. And I had a lot of my own stuff to process. And that's what led me toward the holistic. um, And I was not interested in clinical mental health work on the East Coast. I was very disinterested in traditional clinical mental health training. Once I found this body oriented program, I was like, that's what's for me. And I'm really glad that I made that choice. How can we, if we're, if anybody's interested in the first steps to take to start to look at pelvic health and being aware and taking care of yourself, what should they do? What's the first thing we can do? Well, does something have to be wrong? To no, t- no. Okay. Um, in fact, something that I find so often is that people, like, they just feel disconnected. You know, they're like, I don't, I don't have any symptoms. I don't have any traumas that I know about. Um, Maybe they do have both of those or one of those, but they also, they're just like, something is off. I don't feel connected. I know that this part of me is very important. And like, I don't, you know, and I used to feel that way. Like, I'm like, you know, patient number one, that's, that was my experience and I have a long time yoga practice. I would go to yoga. I'm a yoga teacher. I've done thousands of hours of study and practice. And I would be in these yoga classes and these trainings, and they would talk to us about connecting with our root and finding our ground. And I'm sitting there going, I get the concept, but I don't know the feeling. I don't know what you're talking about. You're talking to me about my pelvic muscles. Like I was like, what? You know, I just, I was so confused. I was so disconnected. And and I've done all of this for myself. You know, I've done um, internal intervaginal pelvic floor therapy work with a practitioner. It was so incredible for me. It organized my system. And I was like, oh, there's my uterus. There's my ovary. There's my muscle, you know, so orienting for me. And whether people want to do that, you know, that's like the farthest you can go is working with the inside of your body or just putting your hands on this part of your body and starting to try to connect. Eventually your system is going to respond, but it can take years. Um, And I'm, I'm kind of a, not aggressive, you know, I think I used to be aggressive with myself, but I'm like, I'm ready. Let's do this. It's just kind of my personality. And so I took myself into that work from a pretty young age. And I'm so glad that I did that with someone who's a safe practitioner who I knew through my dance community. Um, You know, there's a lot of people doing all these different types of body work out there without enough training, in my opinion. And I'm like, "Uh, you need to be really aware of who you're working with and ask them about their credentials and their training and Um, Unfortunately, because people do have very traumatic experiences with some body workers or people that are doing this kind of work. I just feel like I always have to say, be cautious and be very careful. Um, But the first thing to do is, you know, like, can you feel yourself when I talk about rooting and grounding and pelvic connection? Like, do you have the feeling? And if you don't, then that's probably where to start is getting curious about connecting. And that can take a long time. You know, our brain, um, if we go for decades without the connection, and then we do one practice and we're like, oh, this isn't working for me. Like, this is stupid. And that's how I used to be. You know, I'm like making fun of myself. I We have to do it over and over and over and over for many, many years. And then eventually maybe our system will start to respond. It's like, we have to devote ourselves if we want to gain connection to this part of ourselves. And it can be very painful. You know, 
I had a lot of pain as I was doing all of this. My muscles were inflamed. My menstrual cycle was like totally um, changing itself. It was hard to tolerate at certain points. And I was like, I need to get to the other side, you know, eye on the prize. And I just stayed committed to it. And now I do feel that I'm on the other side of it as I'm entering perimenopause, truly. <laughs> like, it's fascinating. The way I understand it, nothing really has to be wrong as such, but you may feel slightly off or disconnected somehow and not quite sure what's going on. You may appear, I suppose, healthy and everything, but there mm -hmm. could be just a disconnection. I think the way you describe that is really helpful because some people are just walking around unaware of what they're really feeling. So maybe that's a good place to start, to center yourself, get in tune. Not everybody does yoga, um, but if they, if you do do yoga and you're feeling a disconnection, so would that be would that be right just to try and center yourself, be it sit down or stand up and see how you feel and if you're connected to your body, you feel your body? Would I, I would think mindfulness would help. Yeah, I know like belly breathing, uh like deep core, the whole abdominal system, all of our organs, like saying hello to them and touching them just on top of the skin and breathing with our core, you know, even just simple breath work can be very transformative, very emotional, very illuminating for people. And, um, you know, I'm a testament. I came in rigid and disconnected and not able to soften and expand. And now I feel every little thing in my core and it's beautiful and it's important to me. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable. You know, I'm getting over COVID right now and my organs just feel nasty. Like I feel it in my organs and I'm like, oh, like it's gross, you know? So I said to my supervisor many years ago, it's starting to dawn on me, like being in my body doesn't always mean feeling good. She was like 80 years old and sitting there looking at me and saying, that's right. You know, like. So it's, we just have to be willing to tolerate discomfort and we also can have so much pleasure and joy and warmth and health that comes from being willing to go into an uncomfortable feeling. And what about people who are now thinking, okay, I, I've heard of the pelvic floor and I've heard of the pelvic floor exercises. So how do I incorporate that or can I use that? What would you say to people who are questioning that absolutely my answer is yes like I really believe we all can I wouldn't say should but it is part of uh health maintenance for me this is a part of our body that is you know our our pelvic organ system is sitting underneath our digestive system our digestive organs are sitting right on top and our digestion and our heart is helping us process everything. You know, our brain leads down to our heart and our heart leads to our stomach and our stomach leads to our whole intestinal, our liver, our spleen, our kidneys, all of our organs are processing our life. So our pelvis is the bottom. And if we're not attending to our pelvis, it's really interesting. Like so often, uh, for example, I've been working with some elders in my practice a couple of times, and it's really interesting. You know, you brought up the um, sociological piece, like people that gave birth 40 years ago, 40, 50, 30 years ago, they're like, whoa, you know, nobody talked to me about this. And it's been many decades. And now I experience this heaviness and this weight and just like, and prolapse, you know, prolapse is where the organ starts to come out. It's dangerous. It's not, not a good thing to just let happen. It can get very severe. We want our organs on the inside, not on the outside. So if we want to avoid all of that or start to heal that, then we do public health maintenance work. And uh, for me, it's absolutely part of my regular routine. It's just like uh, taking care of brushing my teeth, you know, it's something that I try to do at least once a month. Once a week, I think is great. 
And it takes a long time to be able to do all of the internal tissue work if that's what you want to do. Um, some people just start with very gentle massage of their belly, just touching their lower belly with some massage oil. Like that's amazing. You know, if you're doing nothing else, you can start to do that. So I feel like it is a huge boon to our overall health maintenance to do some pelvic health um, work with ourselves. And we all have to start where we are and uh, pushing or rushing or being aggressive with ourselves is not a great way to be. Our body's like, whoa, like, you know, it can feel too jarring and invasive if you are rushing. So my advice is to be very slow and be consistent and do this in small, like really digestible little chunks so that your body doesn't get overwhelmed. And, um, you know, there's tons of different practices that are like herbal medicine, pelvic steaming, castor oil packs, like all of these things are not entering the body, not working with the tissue directly. It's just working with the outside in a very nourishing way. If you get to the point where you want to work with the internal tissues, there are amazing tools that you can use for pelvic massage. There's TheraWands, which is a physical therapy tool. There are um, smoother kind of like the TheraWands are long and thin. And I don't love them for myself because they feel like pokey. Like you kind of feel like it's like, oh, it's like a little too like pointed almost. You know, I'm, I said I'm super sensitive. So I like the smoother, rounder, like a little bit more diffused contact. And you're just upping your circulation. You're upping your hormonal balance. You're bringing blood flow to these tissues. And if we don't have any contact with this part of our body, it's just like anything else. It's going to get stagnant. It's going to get kind of numb. It's going to get a little upset. Um, so I really advocate for taking care of this part of your body, especially as we age. It's like, and so, you know, not everybody has like, I do feel that this part of my body is my Achilles heel, you know, since a young age, I've been working on this. This is just something I have to attend to. I have no other health issues. So I'm like, okay, this is my thing that I have to lean into. And I'm going to for the rest of my life. Other people might, you know, they might be like, I don't think so. You know, like my reproductive system is so amazing and I don't have any challenges and I've birthed six babies and I'm good, you know? So I think you just have to know um, where you're at and what you need. And I know people that have birthed six babies and they're going, I've never had an issue. And now I can't run or play on the trampoline with my kids without peeing myself. And I don't know what to do. And I go to the doctor and they say, oh yeah, that's what happens after you have a baby. And they're like, what? Like, is that true? And so there's so much that we can do to help recover this part of our system if we need it. Um, and unfortunately, we usually don't get those answers from very many. There are some amazing holistic medical professionals for sure. But, um, you know, most medical doctors are, they're just not trained in how to recover. This takes like a slow deeper long-term process. And that's just not how medicine is set up. You know, we're set to fix and cut into and cast up. And like, that's what medicine is really good for, in my opinion. If, if somebody wanted to work with you specifically, can you help them via Zoom? Are there remote sessions? How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, my answer is, it always depends. You know, it, I'm happy to work with people virtually. I've worked with many people virtually. Um, if you want to do this work with yourself, then I really advocate for that. Everyone that I work with in my practice, I'm like, I really advise you to do this work with yourself. This is your body. This is going to be best if you know your body, because then you get to do this for the rest of your life. If you become dependent on a practitioner, it's like it only goes so far. However, only doing work with yourself also sometimes only goes so far. Sometimes there are things that working with a practitioner, like there are certain things that we need a therapeutic relationship and we need that human human and we need um, care, like 
something might be very hard to go through alone. So I really advocate for both. I'm happy to work with people on Zoom and uh, I don't really believe that Zoom is exactly the same. Like being in person with someone is different. And so I really, I like to help people find practitioners. I'm like, uh, the woman that I trained with is named Tammy Kent. She has people all over the country, a lot of people in the UK. She's done um, trainings in the UK. I know that she has practitioners in the UK and she's a physical therapist that was working in the hospital system. And she said, this is emotional. We have to address the emotional piece. And she left the medical world and made her own uh, training. So, and, and it's hard. There's a major need for this and there's not enough practitioners. So I just say to people like, um, get your hands on books, reach out to people, start to build your resources. I've been doing that for, like I said, 15 years and it's amazing now what is available, but it's still not enough and we need more and we need so much education. So uh, yes, I'm happy for people to reach out to me and it really depends on what's going on. If they're like, I have severe prolapse, um, can you fix it for me? I will make a treatment plan, but I will also say you really need to find a provider like in your town and you need to manually start to lift your organs back into your body. Like there's only so much you can do online for this type of thing. So um, yeah, my answer is both are available and both are important. And it always depends what the person has going on before I can say like, yes, definitely. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been enlightening really helpful. I think we're all going to now approach our pelvic health differently or for the very first time for some people. So, and now there's awareness there. So really appreciate you sharing that with us today. Thank Thank you. you. See you again. Thank you so much. Nine Peaches Therapy self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by helping you to achieve confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. Created by an expert practitioner to help you to achieve the best result. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day using the most gentle and effective guided meditations to rid yourself of anxiety, stress, fear, and negative thinking. Available now on Spotify, Apple Music, and other platforms. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.